So hello everyone and welcome back to the third session of the Research Networking Day here at the CTM's Discourse Program. And I'd like to introduce our third host and uh, the head of the next module, Stefan Lepa, who is a postdoc researcher at Audio Communication Group at the Technical University here in Berlin. And his research areas include mediatization, digital media change, media reception, audio branding, music information retrieval, and empirical research methods. And he's He's also the investigator of two research projects, survey music and media, empirical base, basic data and theoretical modeling of the mediatization of everyday music reception in Germany, huge project, and the other one, artist to business to consumer audio branding system, ABC DJ. So Stefan, the, the stage is yours and I'm happy that you took over this role of being here as yeah. a model. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you do not feel too cold. I do after some hours, but I'm still exciting for the upcoming three talks. Um, I think uh, the title of our third module is Stories from the Machine. And uh, when I was hearing this title, I was, of course, knowing we're referring to those kind of machines we call computers and on so-called artificial intelligence. And I think lots of you have heard about or have, are even familiar with things like chat GTP, so machines telling us stories now by uh, when we enter them a prompt. So I was asking myself, what kind of stories would intelligent machines, if they really exist, have to tell? Uh, it's a bit like a variation of the famous Philip K. Dick questions, uh, do Android dream of electric sheep? I don't know. My provocative claim to enter into the discussion would be that we will never hear machines tell us anything creative, intelligent, or even new about the world or themselves. Rather, the only thing that machines will be able to tell us something about is about the humans that built them or fed them with some ground truth. <laughs> I see some noddings on that side. <clears throat> so I think this will be a common topic in the upcoming three talks. Um, let me phrase it that way. How can we mobilize machine learning and software, artificial, artificial intelligence, if you will, so to help us to tell us more interesting stories about uh, ourselves, the world, and our environmental situation than cheap consumer fairy tales that they often tell today. <laughs> and I think uh, I'm excited uh, to hear three variations of answers on that. And uh, the first answer will be coming from Becca Rose. Uh, Becca is an artist and PhD researcher at Goldsmiths University of London. Uh, she co-curates the Control Shift Festival Compu for Computational Arts and will today introduce us to the so-called Potato Computer Club, a place where technology helps people to get more intimate with potatoes. <laughs> I'm actually quite excited to find more about what that actually means. Uh, Becca, come up, the floor is yours. Hello, so um, hi everybody. Um, my name is Becca Rose, as you know. Uh, my pronouns are she, they, and um, it's a real pleasure to be speaking here. Um, so I'm a massive fan of CTM, and so yeah, I'm, thank you for having me, and thank you for being here, and making me feel very welcome. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Potato Computer Club, um, and I'm a little bit nervous about this uh, kind of talk of artificial intelligence because the Potato Computer Club is definitely not about artificial intelligence, but um, maybe there's an interesting discussion anyway around that. Um, so I'm just going to see if my slides are working. Um, have I done the right button? Are they working? Maybe they got... Um, it's all in German, so I'm going to try my best. So, uh, yes. Here we go. Are they being presented? Sorry. It's one, I know it's one of these. It's the presenter display. Yes, thank you. Fabulous. So I'm also going to just um, briefly describe uh, the slides as I go, um, just to give a visual description. So the first slide here, um, it's a scan of a bunch of potatoes and some very cute pixelated potatoes with brightly colored potato computer club um, on it. Um, and, and basically, uh, my my research, um, I'm based at Goldsmiths in the design department, but I also have um, connections with education and computing. Um, and my, my research is looking at um, uh, objects in learning and pedagogical contexts, um, and I'm using or working with 
guides from kind of Donna Haraway and a kind of STS background, but also kind of radical pedagogies such as bell hooks and kind of feminist black perspectives on that. Um, and I'm kind of really interested in objects, um, kind of the agency of objects and materiality as a way to um, connect with computers. Um, and so the Potato Computer Club was kind of born out of that. Um, so how do we get here? How did I start to do my whole PhD on potatoes and computers? Um, it started by accident. I was teaching a coding class to some undergraduate students, and we thought it would be really fun to make potato prints. Um, this was around 2018, so it was the very early stages of my research. Um, and we, as you can see in the picture, there's a, uh, kind of some hands that are cutting out um, some shapes on a potato, and there's some printing, and there's a computer with some kind of simple code, um, and, and kind of showing, illustrating the process that we took. Um, we used a program called P5JS, which is a kind of software for artists um, to learn to code. And um, yeah, I found that there was something really interesting going on um, around um, the way in which, in this context, students uh, responded to the computer or related to the computer um, through uh, the potato. The potato kind of bought uh, some different modes of, inter of relating, such as uh, they felt very relaxed, they connected between each other, telling stories, um, they shared memories, um, and they kind of, there was a lot of playfulness in this space. And I thought, hmm, that's, that's actually quite interesting. Um, something's going on there. Um, and then there was something also I felt quite interesting, this kind of accidental coupling of the potato and the computer, which live very in very different worlds, um, and bringing them together, it, it felt like it was asking some really interesting questions, um, and kind of the potato kind of felt like it was infiltrating in this kind of very technical space. Um, so that, yeah, so that's how I kind of got into the potato, um, and 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 in my research around potato computing. Um, I found that there are a lot of cultural and social references. Um, for example, Agnes Varda, French filmmaker and artist, um, made the Patatopia um, in 2003 for the Venice Biennale, which was kind of an installation um, that transported us um, through a world of beauty through the potatoes. And I'm going to read out this quote. There's a picture here of um, Agnes Varda wearing a kind of paper mache giant potato outfit. And behind her is a uh, kind of gothic mouth um, with potatoes kind of spewing out. And this was part of the Patatutopia exhibition. Um, and I'll read the quote because I think it's quite important and it really has influenced the way in which I see potatoes. Um, and Agnes Varda says, I would like the people who enter to be overwhelmed with emotion and delight, looking at this most ordinary and humble vegetable, the potato, and to share my utopia of believing that beauty of the world, embedded in the beauty of old potatoes, helps us to live and reconciles us with the chaos. There's also a precedence for com uh, potato computing. Um, I've got two images on this slide. One of them is a kind of giant potato with lots of wires and uh, modules sticking out of it. Um, and a uh, potato computer in gaming culture is a obsolete computer. So if you're using a potato computer, you're kind of using a, a kind of old computer that doesn't really run the games or is kind of running really slow. Um, and also, there's another image of a kind of potato uh, with lots of wires sticking out of it, um, which is GLaDOS as a potato, which comes from the game Half-Life from the 1990s. Um, and this is a kind of one of the main characters in the game, which was an, is an AI that's been turned into a potato as the kind of lowest form of intelligence, supposedly, and it was a very humiliating experience. Um, and, and, then, and then also there's, there's quite a, a thriving world of potato computer art. Um, one example I've included here is a recent work by David O'Reilly, who's a kind of game artist, but also animator and just really brilliant artist from Ireland. And they've, uh, in 2021, they made a photo, uh, sorry, a 3D scan of a potato into an NFT and were selling that. Um, so that's kind of recent potato computing art. 
So, um, so yeah, there's something really interesting going on with potatoes and computers, which I had no idea that I would kind of come across this world. Um, and, and all of these different uh, references have kind of helped me frame what the Potato Computer Club is. And what that is, or what it, it has been, is a loose space for exploring digital and electronic encounters with potatoes. And over the course of the last year, um, there have been a number of iterations of this um, taking place as workshops in different contexts, um, taking place as labs, like a week-long lab, um, or kind of hacking events. Um, and so, kind of examples of what we do in these events or in these workshops, we make electrochemical batteries with potatoes, and you can see on the right-hand side an entangled potato circuit. Um, and um, we sense, we probe, we listen with potatoes, and you can see a student kind of listening, uh, working with a potato as a sensor, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to make this work, but there is a, um, a speaker made from a potato, so this is an electromagnetic um, speaker where the vibrations of, um, between the potato, which becomes an electromagnet, um, and a real magnet kind of play a very crackly Cindy Lauper, so I'll play that. It's quite short. Oh, I've lost my... Here we go. So sh short and sweet. Um, uh, oh, there we go. So yeah, also um, we have been scanning potatoes, um, doing what I call potato grammatry, and, um, and making kind of face filters and, and playing and being silly and having a lot of fun uh, with this world of these different relations between potatoes and computers. And all along, um, we have uh, all the workshops kind of lead with sharing stories, um, kind of taking, taking note of the pairing in the workshop and asking questions about it and making space for discussion, making space for memories. Um, on the screen here is an example of some poetry um, that we've been doing in some of the, these sessions where uh, participants will make a poem about how they feel about potatoes and how they feel about computers. Um, yeah, and so um, kind of after spending about a year uh, with, with potatoes, um, I found that um, the potato becomes a kind of portal that opens a space for new meaning making, remembering, storytelling, and it creates a, a kind of new sense of possibility within a kind of the world that's quite defined um, kind of when uh, in my experience of working as a, a kind of pedagogue within computing spaces, people often feel quite distant from the, the, the kind of digital spaces and the potato really kind of helps become this space where we are connected in a very beautiful way, in a, in a, te like in a way that we can relate to childhood or different kind of social and cultural memories. And one example of how this kind of plays out, or how this works, um, is in one workshop um, when we were sensing potatoes, the whole pace of the workshop, of the coding, of a kind of all the making we were doing, just slowed down. And we had a discussion about this, like why did it feel that slow? And it just felt slow because the potatoes were kind of guiding the speed of that workshop. Um, and we started using the term potato time um, in that workshop to describe this process. And so, um, as, as pedagogues, uh, potatoes bring a sense of grounding. Um, okay, they're being from, from coming from the earth. Um, they bring a sense of kinship um, and connectivity through the stories that we, we share. Um, and they, they kind of enliven uh, um, this kind of very technical spaces with their um, playfulness and these kind of almost like cultural memes that they're bringing into that space. And maybe just to kind of go back to um, the original quote, um, I actually have it in my notes here, but for some reason I can't scroll down, so I'm going to quickly scroll through to the, the quote that I, I, I have earlier on here. Um, um, just kind of going back to this idea of, um, of, of Agnes Varda's kind of love and delight for the potatoes. What I'm understanding and what I'm seeing the potato doing is kind of sharing this space for new possibilities and transporting um, 
us into this world of beauty, um, kind of helping us live within this kind of computer chaos. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I have time for today, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing any questions or comments in, the, in a bit, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this uh, very nice presentation. Let me first state that I really like your work because I think that um, working with computers can oftentimes be a very disembodied and also desituated practice. And I think you t turn this, uh, so to speak, uh, from the feet on the head and do something very different. So uh, coming also from a pedagogic background, I would ask you um, how has the work with potatoes transformed your workshop participants? How would you... Describe that. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's it's in, it's really interesting because, um, like you said, embodied and situated, and this is definitely something um, which I've always been doing in my practice, in my pedagogical practice. Um, but I think what's happened with the potatoes, and and I use other objects. I use pom poms. I work with um, masks. I work with lots of different very material practices for us to kind of create relational spaces between. Um, what we're doing and also like very digital kind of uh, non-tangible spaces but the potatoes really they kind of take this these ideas of embodiment and um, tangible and storytelling to another level because there's no doubt um, like an example of this is I'm when I'm working with pom-poms or kind of I, I work with electrical threads and, and conductive materials people often mistake um, what I'm doing for this kind of innovation. And I'll, and I'll go and I'll be doing something at a festival and they'll be like, fantastic, innovation and computers. And I'm kind of like, well, I'm actually not trying to do innovation here. Actually, conductive thread or pom-poms are very the opposite. So what are you saying? And I kind of get, there seems to be this confusion. But when I come to a festival with a potato, there's no doubt. They're like, okay, we, we definitely don't think this is innovation. We don't know what it is, but it's a bit strange, but we think there's some kind of questions and there's some really interesting things going on here. So it just, like, I don't think um, everyone needs to be using or working with a potato in their <laughs> practice, but I just think what it does is it just really highlights some of those really interesting things. Yeah, absolutely. I think you already now answered my second question, uh, which would have been, uh, who are the participants of your workshop? So you, show you are going on festivals, or, or are you also doing it at the university? Uh, tell yeah, us a bit so about Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned the first one. That was when I was working at the University of West of England, um, and that was students, so undergraduate students. Um, but I've worked, I've done a week-long lab um, with uh, uh, art students, um, and I think that's a big thing, um, and I also teach at Camberwell, the University of London, on their computational arts program. And I think that's partly why I'm doing some of the research, because there's this kind of space, like the computational arts program that I teach on, um, it's in the fine art department. And there's also a computational, I forgot what it's called, creative coding, I think, it's creative computing course in the same university. So there's these two courses. Um, and, and it's very confusing what's going on. But with the computational arts, what we're doing is we're working with computers and we're working with software in a very creative way, and we're trying to feel this embodied practice. Um, and so that means that we're, we need to kind of just access the, 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 the tools in this very visceral way. Um, and that's, there isn't a lot, a lot of the kind of research and a lot of the approaches that, that are kind of being developed around creative coding or computational education come from more an engineering and a science, computer science background, and they're not necessarily allowing students to be just guided by their feelings, by their storytelling, and all these different things. So, so I'm kind of definitely working with um, kind of uh, young people working in arts. And then maybe just to add to that, um, on this journey, on this, I'm still kind of completing my research, my PhD, but on this journey, I've, um, I've kind of started this relationship with potatoes and, you know, maybe kind of in a similar way to some of the previous talkers that uh, have been talking about more than human um, interactions, I am really trying to think of the potato as a collaborator and a, and a participant in the space. And that obviously that's not, I'm not trying to, um, you know, make them, you know, anthropomorphize the potato, but just trying to listen and, and understand and work together. And I really have to pay attention to my language. So 
so often I'll slip into a word, I'll say I'm using potatoes, for example, and I have to kind of, you know, go back on that because I, we're working together and, you know, it's, it's, and I even just said that just now, I don't know if you noticed, but, um, yeah, just trying to see potatoes in that, in that way as well. <laughs> that brings me to my last, maybe a bit funny question, but can you still like uh, do normal things with potatoes like cooking or do you feel then already <laughs> like uh, you have now to put some threat in it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, the thing is, is it, it just is now, I, I don't know, like it, I, I'm going on this journey and, it, and it's very, you know, I, just, I didn't mean to start this work with potatoes. It happened and it just kind of came into my life. But, but it's um, people, se people send me memes or people send me potato links all the time, like I'm getting two messages a week and someone the other day was on a bus and they looked to the side of them and there were three potatoes just on the chair on the bus and uh -huh. they were like, look, and I was just like, what is this? Um, so I do have this kind of interesting relationship but I can cook with potatoes still. There's my, they are my favorite, favorite thing to eat, so yes. I see. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pekka. Thank you, <laughs> thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, Now to something completely different, so to speak. Let's come to our second presentation featuring uh, Cem Chakmak, hopefully I pronounce it right, who is a Berlin-based sound artist, performer and postdoc researcher in electronic arts, originally stemming from Istanbul. As far as I learned, his work focuses on spatial sound and machine learning, two areas I'm also quite familiar with. Hence, I'm excited to learn about his ideas of unlearning and ignorance in AI-based music systems. Cem, floor is yours. Yeah. <laughs> Sound check. Okay. <coughs> uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jem Chakmak. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me, giving me a space to share my little research with you. Um, and I will, it, it's a bit of an experimental research with experimental results, but please don't get intimidated by numbers. And uh, also for the record, I'm not an expert in machine learning in any way. I'm not trained in anything like that. I'm an engineer, civil engineer, who studies sonic arts and sound art. And I'm a freelance researcher and musician. So if I say something wrong about AI and machine learning, please don't be angry. <coughs> so first, the background of my research is, um, so I'm a musician coming into the AI field and trying to find ways to do something with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I look at the field of research and field of AI research is almost single-minded in the, in, the, in the sense that uh, you, for, for improving AI, you need to imp expand your data sets and improve your models. Better models feed more things, feed more data in better models and you will have better AI. And this works. It's uh, AI developed significantly in the last couple of years, and a lot of companies, corporations, made a lot of money um, by harvesting your personal data in questionable ways. And today we have um, we're establishing more data protection laws, and these companies need to remove some of the personal data from their um, databases, but they already train their models with this data, so they need to, so machine, this is where the machine unlearning comes in. They need to unlearn, these models need to unlearn the personal data so they can remove it out of their system. And this uh, research field is pretty uh, new, it's ongoing, I would say, and it focuses on such issues to remove personal data. And there are different theoretical and practical methods, and the most common one is basically removing the undesired data and then retraining a system. This is called exact unlearning and the results are basically similar to going into the model and trying to extract information from there. Retraining it is going to give you the same result more or less. And the other, another learning could be approximate unlearning. Approximate unlearning, you would not require the original data set to find the information and take it out, but as the name suggests, it's approximate. So the main challenge in this field is to reduce computational uh, weight and increase efficiency and uh, try to figure out the quickest way to take uh, personal data out. Um, so, learning and unlearning kind of like play against each other, but ignorance and intelligence in the artificial, in, this, in the field of artificial intelligence, but also in human uh, communications, um, they're not exactly the opposite thing, are they? I mean, being ignorant and ignoring something are not the same. And um, 
artificial ignorance is also a discourse on what the AI can't know, like what, what are its limitations, what it shouldn't know, like what, it, what should it leave out to perform better, or what it mustn't know, which is personal information and so on. So by choosing or uh, selecting information, by selecting to ignore information from, um, for, for example, my presentation right now, I'm making an intelligent act because I'm not breaking everything down in little definitions and, and details and treating you like not so intelligently. So ignorance is a part of our, part of our daily life. We choose to remove information to make our communication clearer. And uh, so I asked some research questions, and how can I bring this into the realm of music? And this, uh, this almost uh, the law of AI, which is more data and improved learning, plus improved learning equals better music. Is that true? Better, better models, which is true, but is it also the case with music? This, is that the right way to make sounds, this kind of maximalist approach? And. Um, so the main question is, by concealing and ignoring data, can we make models make better music? Something better, really. It's a definition of uh, success, and uh, many AI research has different success criteria for analysis, information extraction, um, archiving, and so on. So not every music AI research is focused on creating original music, but in this, in this case, this would be our success criteria in this research. So can we make it forget to improve results? And some, one of, some of the objectives are to use free and open source tools. There's so many on, online, and there's just an abundance of tools, and it's just such a contradiction to the lack of methods to use them. So use free and open source tools also to communicate the research to other people so they can replicate what I'm doing as well. This is also an important part of uh, transmitting research. And um, Overall, stay in the realm of music. That's the objective. Be a musician. <laughs> so application to, to apply these concepts to, in a practical way, I choose a certain set of tools. Uh, first of all, I need a database of sounds, so I take a MIDI database because my computer can handle only so much information, and with audio training and stuff, I just don't have that capacity. I choose a MIDI database. It's a relatively small database of classical music, well-known classical music, and uh, about one hour or something, 64 tracks. And this is relatively small in terms of training and AI. Um, in terms of the coding environments, I use Python and their libraries, Pretty MIDI for modifying the MIDI dataset. And Magenta I use uh, as a, to explore the role of machine learning in the process of this creation. And I used specifically the performance RNN model from that, uh, from that set of models in Magenta. So we will try to influence this model's outputs through unlearning. And lastly, I write my code. I have my code written for me in ChatGPT. I think everyone heard of it by now. And um, I immediately got my hands on it, and I started to interact with it in certain ways. And it enables me to code with a metamusical language, which is very important for me. I don't need to uh, steer away from the world of music to write code. I use a metamusical language to communicate to ChatGPT to write me the code that I need. So, we, so with, the, with the help of ChatGPT and my original data set, I start to construct these different sets of uh, data. The first one is the original set of classical music songs, for example, here. You have a MIDI transcription of a Mozart piece. And um, how I try to approach this is to create some kind of an, uh, structure where some information is going to be concealed, but also some harmonic information is maintained in there. So an easy, the easiest thing I could uh, do, probably, was to remove all the white piano keys out of this Mozart competition, uh, composition. So what you would have is uh, just the five, uh, the five keys, C sharp, D sharp, uh, F sharp, G sharp, uh, A sharp, and uh, that creates a pentatonic structure, and that's inherently sounding nice. It's not that dissonant. So if you don't know how to p play a piano, sit down and just play the black notes. It will sound fine. A musician's tip. <clears throat> So it won't sound as dissonant, so that was my strategy. And the third set, I also, from, from the process of modifying these data sets, you have faulty 
uh, versions, and uh, sometimes they don't work as you intended, but I wanted to keep one of those sets like uh, together with the experiment to train it as well, see what happens. It's missing about half its content and uh, in not so ordered way. So the set number two is like very strategic, but set number three is like randomly, randomly uh, removed notes. Let's check the stats a bit. So I put these three different sets in training with the model. So the model is trying to look through these sets and trying to figure out patterns and figure something out. And we have two indicators when we're training it, loss and accuracy. And basically, you're trying to decrease the loss as much as you can and increase the accuracy as much as you can. And the best place when the machine is at the lowest loss and highest accuracy, that's kind of like the, it's doing its best. So when we look at the three sets, one, two, and three, you can see the uh, evaluation uh, graphs here. Uh, the first one with the original set, it takes a long time, and uh, it gets to a certain level, and then it uh, goes back up. To the value of loss goes back up, so it's starting to get overfit. Um, so the best place to stop is like when the, when the loss is at the lowest. And uh, compared to that, the second set with the unlearned data learns much faster to better statistical numbers. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it, when you look at the stats in the first, in the first, uh, at the first time, you think, OK, there's less, less information in there, so it's easier to figure something out and learn. But this is where the set number three comes in. I, I'm glad I tried to train that one as well, because when you see, when you have, it, when you have a set with, uh, that is on learning information with a musical intention, we see this training response. But in the third set with randomly unlearned information, there's no response at all. So I'm not really sure. Like I said, I'm not a machine learning scientist or AI scientist. So I'm not really sure what's going on. And I can't make any general statements. But in the, in the context of this research, unlearning in a musical uh, language makes a significant training response uh, compared to randomly unlearned data sets. Just wanted to put some sounds on to listen to what they sound like. Mostly, I got outputs that I anticipated in the first place. Um, so the piano, the performance RNN model is like a piano player. It's a drunk piano player. And if you don't teach it anything, it will try to play the piano in all the notes and keys and different velocities and so on. And the first run with the original data set, there's a lot of information in there about counterpoint and all that stuff. And it's the first one we can listen to it, and then we can discuss uh, what it sounds like, maybe. That was like a little output, one of a thousand outputs that I cherry picked out of. But um, um, compared to the un not, compared to the version where it learns nothing, it's you can notice it's trying to form little patterns and little small chunks of organized movement here and there. And uh, who knows? With if you feed them more data, maybe you can get better and it can make you more um, music that is more reminiscent of uh, classical uh, classical music theory. And you can even have a, maybe a form or something. But I don't know. That's not our intention, is it? Like, we're going the other direction. We're trying to make more expression with less information. And um, so the second one is the unlearned set. And even just looking at it, you see there's, the density of notes is much, much less. And also, we also see we trained the second model with the, only the black keys of the piano, but that didn't, uh, the outputs don't really. Uh, come out like that. So there's some white keys in there also. So what's going on? And let's have a listen to it and see what it sounds like.
so <laughs> it's not perfect, but um, I feel like you can hear some kind of uh, mood going on. But uh, you know, it's not really it's not really the computer's uh, thing. It's what's happening in your brain. So j even by just like d decreasing the density of nodes, our brains have more space to create meaning between these uh, nodes, right? So it gives us more more of an information. Um, so it's not all white piano keys, but I also wanted to draw the attention. There's no chromatic movement in the in the set, in the example. So the, almost the in intervals it's using is kind of similar to the intervals of the black piano notes, but the notes themselves uh, change, which was interesting to find. And the third run is like something in between where the model doesn't learn anything, but you can also see there's like less notes and it's trying to resemble the data set with the missing notes, but uh, there's no. There's no pattern, or the, it's just random. I mean, we can listen to an example, and uh, we can talk about that for last. Um, so yeah, it sounds a bit jazzy, but I don't think it has anything to do with the training. It's just the, you know, less things happening, so we're, you know, finding those meanings in there. So that's it for uh, at this point. This is uh, as far as the research goes. And uh, to sum up, to wrap everything up, what we're doing is basically subtractive data science. We're doing subtractive. Uh, interference in the original data sets, and by ignoring those parts of data sets, we try to ensure they unlearn in a way that I artistically prefer. If done with a purpose, less data may pro produce more expression, and uh, I hope this was interesting to you, and I look for questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for your interesting presentation. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to thank you that you also uh, bring up this, uh, I think, again, very political topic of pr privacy in the realm of social media and the right of getting forgotten and kind of transferred to the to questions of music creation. Um, so my first question would be to, to stay a bit on the political level and not directly go to your talk. Uh, <laughs> Um, I've had some discussions with visual artists recently about mid-journey and these kind of things uh, where, where um, graphics are produced from uh, ground shoes from other artists and they say it's violating their copyright. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if, if that is really true. Uh, how do you feel about that when it comes to music? I mean, you're a mu musician yourself. Yeah. How would you feel if uh, like large machine learning databases are built also uh, drawing on samples of your creativity? I would love it. I would say it's me doing it. <laughs> it's not I, I don't care. I don't. I don't. I'm not interested in profiting from selling music, but uh, I do installations and ex exhibitions and fundings for research and so on. And that's how I operate in my musician music practice. Um, but yeah, the politics of it is huge, and I really don't want to get too much into it. But this is where I came to the to this subject, especially in the. I'm an academic researcher and I keep up with these re new research projects and open calls and uh, sort of new positions in universities researching music and technology. And uh, it's, it's so apparent that lately it is so saturated with AI research. It's almost like any research that includes machine learning and AI gets thrown a lot of money just, like, just because they have it in there. So. Uh, in, in terms of music and technology research, I think we need more musicians and less technologists. Okay. Not to like <laughs> offend anyone, but um, yeah. yeah, I think AI tools can give us that that, that uh, opportunity to make it better and more. Yeah, musical. I agree. And in that sense, I feel that you don't feel threatened at all by artificial intelligence as a musician. Rather, you see it as a helpful tool, no, right? It's, I, it's just cold. I'm not into. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it's, uh, it's easy to paint these dystopic scenes around AI, and that's how I came into it as well. I think the, the, the first trigger was the back, back story of Dune, 
<laughs> where uh, it's Dune is set in a world where AI is illegal, it's banned, a jihad happens thousands of years ago, and no, making, making machines in the image of the human mind is outlawed. And so I can, okay, well, okay, it's more centering on humans, it's a science fiction thing. He wrote it because he didn't know what AI was at the time, but um, that's, that, that sparked my interest in the, in, in the subject. I see. Okay, coming back to your talk, I, I think you brought up some very interesting ideas also uh, for someone who professionally uses machine learning in, in music informatics and so on. So um, the first thing that came to my mind when I listened to your talk was this issue of ignorance and unknowing that these are really human qualities in a very positive sense. Absolutely. You know, normally we think of it as something bad. Oh, we forget things that we might have seen and so on. But actually, it's something very worthy. Mm -hmm. And this is what mm -hmm. I liked about your talk. One could say um, attention, or let's say the human consciousness, to take a more broad term, is a very nice perceptual filter that we have. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have it, we mm -hmm. would probably be overwhelmed by all the input that when we're going through the world. Right? All we do is filter things. When, when I look at the room, it's just white noise, all the waves and all the information bouncing around, but we filter things out to understand them. So, exactly. Yeah. So now if we put ourselves in the shoes of the machines, they are poor beings. They don't have these filters. Mm -hmm. They don't have like an attunement to, to uh, reach a certain goal. This is always what we need to give them. And in that sense, I found it striking somehow that you also gave them the, the, your human quality of ignorance and put it into the algorithm. Well, it, I, I was hoping it would make them more intelligent. <laughs> so, like, um, it's ignorance and intelligence, they play with each other, but uh, artificial intelligence has such an unfortunate name, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit misleading, kind of like virtual reality. But, um, yeah, I, I really think you can, I mean, there's obviously much more uh, computer science related research about improving AI machines with excluding information like this. Yeah. Okay, maybe last short question, short answer, because we're a bit in the delay. Oh, sorry, yeah. uh, no, no problem. Uh, um, so you did this with a very small MIDI piano database. Uh, are you planning to build on that? Are you planning to grow larger models with that kind of strategy or is it more like a, how can I say, like an like a example for your theoretical approach that you wanted to give us? It's more... Um, it's more like a tactic than a strategy. So I, I, I do this to put out uh, some, something, of a, something that has musical information, but that's not the end, uh, that's not where I want to get. That's just the place to take it somewhere else. So for example, when I try to anticipate these pentatonic outputs, I'm also trying to think like, okay, I'm gonna get like a five-tone uh, five uh, harmonic uh, structure, doesn't have to be uh, based on the 12 tone equal temperament, right? I can go and diff try different media is just an abstraction and I can take it to another place. But I think I'm more concerned with the compositional uh, opportunities than uh, developing models because I'm not trained uh, to develop AI models. Okay, excited what will come out of that. Yeah. Thank you very much, <laughs> Jim. <you>. And uh, <laughs> before we come to our final discussion. We will first have our third speaker. Uh, Hugo Scoto is a postdoc artistic researcher and designer from Marseille, France, who has been studying at Urkam in Paris and also Goldsmith in London. And his presentation will be focusing on combining the logics of audio walks with deep learning. Uh, this makes me wonder whether also the French tradition of uh, the acousmatique, as coined by Pierre Schaeffer, will be featured here. And hence, I'm looking forward to Hugo's talk. Hugo, the floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Fine. Okay, uh, so um, my name is uh, Hugo Strotto. Uh, first, uh, I would like to say that I'm very happy to be here today and honored to participate to CTM Festival. 
And so my talk is going to um, discuss a notion that I introduced in, uh, in the frame of my research, that is the deepscape. So uh, global flows of sounds produced by uh, AI, and uh, especially uh, by deep learning. Um, so one of the first uh, sounds that may have been produced by AI and that has uh, reached uh, global popularity was the voice of Siri, an intelligent assistant built by Apple in the early 2010s. Um, so let's hear it. Okay, I set up your meeting with David tomorrow. Shall I schedule it? So I guess everyone is familiar with this voice, perhaps. So this is basically not the recorded voice of a human person. It is a sound that is generated by a deep neural network, which was trained over the voice of Susan Bennett, an American voice actress. Um, so th this deep learning generated voice typically reinforced the androcentric stereotype that uh, intelligent assistants should have a, a feminine gender identity. Um, this stereotype is always uh, very present nowadays as flows of voices generated by uh, deep learning keep on permeating both our public and private spaces, digital and physical. Um, ten years after, and uh, actually three days ago, um, Google Research released uh, Music LM, um, an AI system that can generate music, not voice, uh, sometimes voice, let's say music, based on text prompts. So this is basically uh, similar to a recent prompt-based AI, such as DALI, uh, in the domain of images, which here it is in the domain of uh, music. So music LM consists of several deep neural network, uh, networks trained over millions of scr songs scraped over the internet without necessarily having the consent of human persons that produce them. Um, so on the internet, uh, Google provided some example prompts with the associated generated audio. So let's listen to some of them. So this was clearly the 50s. Club in the 60s. Club in the 70s, and so on and so forth. And so we can hear that um, we can hear that music LM can produce some kind of portals to uh, other epochs of our histories by reactivating archives of music over which it was trained. So in previous years, other AI systems uh, such as Jukebox have flooded social networks with music generated by deep learning, provoking debates among communities of musicians, with pioneer contribution from artist Holly Handel. And we can expect that music LM and its prompt based uh, abilities will increase these global flows in the coming years with uh, associated transformations of societies. So it's good to end this by futuristic club music, I guess. Uh, now it is important to recall that um, such global flows of uh, sounds are actually uh, supported by intensive computational infrastructures of AI. So here uh, we can see the AI Research Supercluster, a supercomputer built by Meta uh, in the last year and dedicated to AI research. So to build it, rare elements such as lithium are extracted across the planet, contributing to huge levels of atmospheric and water pollution and devastating landscapes of both humans and non-humans. So such ecological costs of AI adds up to the cultural and political issues previously evoked. So in my research, I was interested in, in developing an alternative concept for AI that destabilizes its marketed anthropomorphism and better represents its media aesthetics and planetary scales. So I propose to introduce the concept of deepscape um, that points at the scape of AI. So the deepscapes primarily, uh, cons may primarily consist of global flows of media um, produced by deep neural networks, encompassing sounds, as, as we heard, but also image and text, as recent systems such as DALI or ChatGPT 3 uh, have shown. The deepscape also encapsulates the computational infrastructures that support its global flows, including the internet, uh, supercomputers, and importantly, big tech. As previous examples showed, the Deepscape is primarily uh, developed and invested by Meta, Google, Apple, and others. 
last but not least, the deepscape is fueled by different types of resources. That is uh, material, for example, lithium, but also human, um, because uh, deep learning infrastructures uh, rely on engineers and uh, lots of data workers that need to maintain the, uh, the infrastructures. And uh, of course, the cultural resources, because as we have seen and heard, um, the, the output, the success, as we have said this afternoon, of such AI uh, music system also relies on the fact that they are built on cultural artifacts and that they reconfigure them. Um, so as an artist researcher, my wish was to create forms that enables to reveal the deepscape and perhaps to reconfigure it through collaborative practice. Um, so a first project is called a Deepscape Transversal. So this is a radiophonic work consisting of a planetary soundscape generated by uh, one deep neural network. So what we hear in the background since the beginning of the presentation is actually an extract of Deepscape Transversal. So I will continue. Anyway, it generates uh, perpetuously. So the artwork actually leverages a, a 16 hour of soundscape uh, that I have recorded online on uh, over 28 places worldwide in five, five continents in, uh, over a weekend in late April uh, 2022 um, as the data sets for a deep neural network. And so the strangely rumbling soundscape that continuously unfolds from the deep neural network was described by members of the audience as a, another planet inhabited by Martians, uh, or also as an impossible landscape uh, of windy ocean with small insects and land grass. So my wish through, through this artwork is that uh, it enables people to listen to the terraformation process underlying AI that is how, how the landscapes of the planet are getting threatened and transformed as uh, AI sucks our attention away from it. A second project um, that I'm, I'm actually uh, leading right now is called Latent Atlantis. So it consists of a virtual experience um, where a human person walks through a three-dimensional virtual world to explore the latent sound space of a deep neural network. So this is a short video of a preliminary test made with New Atlantis, a web-based virtual platform dedicated to shared sonic experimentation. Uh, so with my colleague Ludmila Postel, our wish is that um, such individually, indiv individual and collective soundworks through the deepscape may destabilize anthropomorphic representation of AI by fostering special modes of sonic resonance uh, with a deep neural network and creating portals with bodies and places contained in training datasets of deep learning. So in the video, um, so sound is not generated uh, in real time, but in the actual version, you can, each, it, every time you move, you modify the, the soundscape generated by deep learning. So a third and last project uh, is called Deepscape Longitudinal. Um, it is an installation consisting on a, of an audiovisual landscape generated by deep learning. Um, so to generate this landscape, I have engaged in a year-long data collection practice in the Calanque of Marseille. Two times per week since uh, September uh, 2022, I go to the same place at different times of the day to create a sonic and visual archive of the la Calanque landscapes as it evolves over the year. And from this archive, the deep neural network learns a model of the planet's motion around the sun uh, with corresponding climatic variations. Um, and so in this project, what, what actually struck me uh, along the, along the sun walk, let's say, is the personal learning that was brought to me. 
rather than machine deep learning, um, here the actual deep learning lied uh, in regenerating my attention to the sounds and images always and already produced by uh, the environment. Um, so since the beginning of the project, I have kept a learning journal in which I try to transcribe the bodily experiences of encountering the Calanque landscape parallel to data collection by taking free inspiration from deep listening techniques from composer Pauline Oliveros. Um, so by the end of the year, I will entangle the flows of sounds and images generated by uh, deep learning from my year-long data, landscape data set with thoughts from the learning journal, uh, with the hope that it uh, will give voice to other practices of the deepscape and opening a portal to planetary concepts of AI, which I believe uh, deserves to be heard just as much. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. <laughs> OK, take a seat. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. You. I'm still a bit uh, converged into the sounds, I have to yes. um, say. Uh, so where do we start? So what I found very interesting was the last uh, thought that you mentioned about your uh, last project, that uh, as a well, engineer, artist, slash in between, you also learned something about the environment in this project. Can you, can you give some, some detail about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so first, uh, I, I am not an engineer. I'm basically, uh, my practice more relates to hacking. I was trained as a physicist, okay. and I'm an autodidact musician. So basically, I had a, a relationship with matter and uh, material environments from both my studies, but also my, um, my familiar practice of sound work uh, as I was a child with my family in, in the Calanque of Marseille, basically. So basically, this work enabled me to go back to where I come from. Um, and so uh, in my research, I tried to entangle uh, my uh, subjective perspective and my subjective um, uh, um, uh, journey in, with uh, what I am doing as a researcher in the academic world. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your, your questions, but... Uh, no, no. Uh, I was interested in what specifically did you learn about the environment okay. at that point. C can you give some example for that? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, what something that came out of me is I basically as a uh, sound artist, I was interested in uh, recording sounds uh, by going to the Calanque landscape. And actually, the the most uh, impressive encounter that I uh, managed to do there was not uh, um, heard, cannot, couldn't be heard, because it was the encounter with the, the earth and with the rocks that constitute uh, the Calanque and that do not make produce sounds, actually, uh, or else they produce uh, like vibrations, seismic vibrations, but they are, uh, I do not have the equipment to record it, and I cannot listen to it uh, like this. So. Um, but by going th there uh, every uh, every week, two times a week, uh, I managed. I mean, I try to build, uh, to reflect on this relationship, how to give voice to the planet, um, since it doesn't produce sound. And so that's why I I, uh, I combine the sound uh, with a visual, even if that's um, a quite stereotypical visual of a landscape. Uh, I try to to um, to record it uh, as it is to give a voice to it. Yeah, what I find very interesting is that feed recording seemed to play a major role in your in your work, which is quite kind of an old practice that we have like a hundred years or so, if not even longer. And I was interesting um, because it went a bit quick. Can you um, give some detail on the first project that you mentioned, with the uh, trans transversal, I think it was called? Um, how did you perform these feed recordings from all over? The did you personally go there, or how did no. it work? Yeah, uh, I uh, went a bit fast on this. So I basically relied on, an, on a project uh, that uh, is called Locustream, which yeah. is um, led by the Locustonius team in Aix-en-Provence in the south of France since uh, 16 years, actually. And it consists of an online, online map with uh, open microphones uh, displayed yeah. around the world. And so when you click on, uh, on one of these microphones, they can be deployed by either scientists, artists, or uh, anyone who wants to, now there is an app to, to open a microphone. We could open a microphone right now, actually. And so 
what I did is that I, I relied on this uh, online platform to lead some kind of online field recording uh, over a weekend, uh, in which I connected to uh, audio streams from uh, various places, and I listened to it kind of deeply uh, uh, while recording it. So this is a kind of, I, I didn't, it, it, it was a matter to reduce also my uh, carbon uh, emissions, even yeah. if the internet connection costs something, but I don't go to, to these places. Very interesting. It seems like a parallel to webcams that we had in the late 90s, you know, yeah. where you had a webcam on every place, maybe we should have web microphones everywhere. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, well, it raises a lot of ethical questions. I mean, each, uh, each, smar uh, each uh, smartphone. Its microphone that is uh, actually uh, deployed uh, comes with a, a long story of negotiation with uh, uh, local populations to ensure that there are no um, uh, privacy concerns raised by such microphones. Yeah. No. <laughs> but anyway. I guess so, yeah, very interesting work. Um, I think uh, given the time, I would like to open up the discussion now for all three speakers. So could you please come up here? I think we maybe make some space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Have a> seat, <laughs> <or here. laughs> Becca and Jim, yeah. So, but maybe l let me still continue with the third question of you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, I w wanted to ask you the same question that I asked to, to Jim, maybe uh, uh, to come to this uh, political or let's say creativity dimension of AI that is a bit like the subtopic here. Yeah. So do you, as a, as a sound artist, feel threatened in any way by these new developments in AI? Um, so I would s my answer will be that I have the privilege to get fundings from, for my research, academic research uh, work. So I do not uh, need to p make music to, to eat or to make a living. So right now I don't feel threatened by AI because of my uh, very uh, own positioning relative to this. But I, I think that there are uh, some concerns that, uh, that are, uh, of course, that are raised by such a transformation, uh, the transformation that, uh, that it brings, of course. Yeah, I mean, in, in a way, as, as you also put up with the p p topic of the microphone that we just, uh, it, it raises question of identity and who, who is owning a sound that he or she votes, yeah. you know? Yeah, and uh, yeah. yeah. All right. I agree. Okay, uh, let's uh, get you all three a bit into the discussion. Um, so one uh, thing I was putting up before we started with all of your uh, very interesting presentation was the idea that maybe we need to turn in uh, thinking about how machines can be incorporated in our social reality. And I think all your presentations shed some light on that topic to not think of machine as something that is abstract, uh, like uh, very cognitive, very disembodied, desituated, but more like something that we can interact with that can be become a partner and not something like an artificial human. So maybe uh, each one of you could, could, could tell how, how does your work um, address this topic of how can we live in a proper way or in a better way with machines? Maybe, Jim, you want to start? Sure. I, I really think the best way to handle these kinds of technologies and incorporating them in our lives is to understand what they're doing and uh, what they cannot do as well. So. Oftentimes, in many different fields, it's a very human tendency to anthropomorphize technology. So give, giving it the wrong um, labels and giving it the wrong uh, definitions, I think, uh, hurts more than its, its threat to us when it works properly. Thank you. Becca? Um, yeah, I'm just thinking about um, living well with, with machines. And I think one of the the, the parts of my practice um, that maybe expand some of the things that you were saying about where the data servers come from and it's this materiality of machines and you know everything comes from this planet everything comes from this earth and 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 these kind of digital spaces are um, described as clouds or, or have these kind of ethereal ways of, of speaking about them but actually they're very material and they're very embodied in the earth so I think it's that understanding that connection between um, between the earth and us and the machines in a tangible way 
Yeah, I agree. I think this also resonates with something that you brought up in your presentation, that we maybe do not, not even have to understand what machines do and how they work, but also what they are made of, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and I will j just add on, the, on this point. So I will, perhaps we need to know who governs the machines, because um, of course machines do have an uh, agency on their own. They have computational materialities, and uh, they can be used uh, as this in artistic practice or everyday life. But most of the time, in talking about AI, there are some massive uh, infrastructures, as I've tried to summarize in my talk, um, that governs their, their behavior. So perhaps one way, a uh, pedag pedagogical way, would be to, to talk more about uh, such social material infrastructure. In that way, also to, to raise awareness. Yeah. 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 I agree. And um, maybe a bit related to that is something that also I think came up in your presentation, Becca, is the point that um, when we work with machines, we can ourselves be tend to become very disembodied, you know, just sitting in front of a screen every day. So um, I don't know, uh, how, maybe it's a very broad question, but how can art, how can sound art uh, help with um, yeah, getting away, or, or how to put it, like uh, put people more in a mobilized mode when interacting with computers. Do you have any ideas on that? I mean, I don't have any answers, but I do have um, some interesting observations. And, yeah. and that is, um, I remember I was teaching a class a few years ago when I first started uh, teaching at the university. And I was having a discussion with a student about a laptop. And I was like, oh, I can't wait for us to have you know, these like laptops that are like worn around this, and we can do all these things. And they were like, what? That's never gonna, that's just a laptop, that's all it is. And mm -hmm. I was just like, oh my goodness. Because, you know, this laptop is just this format that we've decided computers are gonna be for now. But, you know, of course, they're gonna be expanded and different. And yeah, so I guess it's just not really an answer, but just this, I think there is this idea that the laptop or this kind of, um, the way in which we see it, computers, is, is very formalized and, and opening up that possibility. Um, I don't wanna say it in a kind of, um, like, uh, you know, metaverse kind of way, like we were going to be uh, 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 participating in that way, but just it's really nice to just think of things in a different way and, and reimagine how we can um, make things or, or interact with machines. Yeah, with bodies. Hello, ladies, from you. Um. What was the question? <laughs> um, I was aiming a bit at, at the question, how can we get away from this unhealthy lifestyle of yeah, living with uh, computers? I, and can uh, sound art maybe help, help with that? Yeah, I hope so, because uh, I also I come from a computer music practice, mm -hmm. and uh, it's such a disembodied uh, field. I yeah. uh, imagine an instrument player like on stage, and they can close their eyes, and they can you know, let it go and go into a different state and something. Imagine playing the computer with your eyes closed. <laughs> Something's gonna get messed up in like a second. So it's always this other that you're logically interacting with and it's very difficult. And a lot of research around this is to like make sensors and interactive devices to make the experiences more embodied. I have a lot of friends who are producing very cool research on these kinds of things. But it's it's a problem that's uh, that's around, and it doesn't seem to have a practical solution right now. I will add a practical solution, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is to going out and trying to work less. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we all yeah. agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. But yeah, I think we tend as a, as a society, Western society, to forget. Uh, the basic things, to forget to listen to our own bodies. Um, and uh, this is a short answer. Of, uh, actually, uh, I, I could uh, talk uh, longer about this, but I think it's clear. But, uh, I think it's quite on point. Uh, now let, let us open this discussion up uh, to the audience. Any questions maybe to our presenters? I see someone there. Do we have a microphone? Yeah, I was uh, thinking about this idea of uh, the unlearning and the perhaps unwriting our conditioning, uh, providing a different reading of technology. I was wondering if you have experimented with uh, training the machine to uh, delete or introduce silences into musical pieces so they can be, I don't know, 
play back uh, a very well-known pop piece, but without the parts that the machine has forgotten because, I don't know, this erasure of the traces uh, uh, in a poetic sense. Uh, I don't know if you have, have thought about it. Um, my understanding is the machine will do whatever you're showing it. The machine will try to imitate what you're showing it, right? So in, if, you're, if you're trying to increase the moments of silence in a piece of the out output of the machine, my way is through unlearning. I create these kinds of silences in the code, uh, in the data set, and uh, hope that the agent figures it out. And also in the training da data you look at, uh, there are other parameters in more detailed in terms of accuracy. It's, uh, I really don't know, like you guys know these things better than I do, but uh, you also watch out for these parameters called event accuracy and no event accuracy. And I think it's trying to basically figure out where the notes come in and how often they should come in and when they should not come in. So my method to influence those things is to un unlearn those data sets and create that situation so the machine can imitate it. Any other questions? There's someone raising his arm. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you all for some interesting talks. Uh, um, your uh, talk about uh, Potato Club uh, hit, uh, I think, a particular nerve for me as a computer stu uh, science student myself. I have felt quite like disembodied and disconnected to essentially what I'm doing the whole day. Uh, and I don't really have personal experience with deep learning myself, but then I imagine dealing with this mysterious black box uh, makes this uh, like takes this a step further. Uh, so this one goes to all of you. Uh, what thoughts do you have around making, working with uh, deep learning, machine learning, uh, especially in a creative context, feel more connected and more embodied? I could uh, give uh, at least my perspective on, on the question. Thanks for the question. Um, so in my practice, I try to rely as much as possible on listening as a practice to interact with the deep learning. Uh, so for example, uh, in some papers that I published, I um, tried to reconfigure the epistemology of uh, deep learning uh, by putting first the, the, the semi-aesthetic behavior, uh, I will call it like this, that it can produce uh, through different kinds of materializations, uh, be it sounds or also uh, some kind of objects, robotic objects, which I do, do not, did not uh, talk about at all in, in this uh, but basically, um, I would say that um, trying to, uh, as much as possible, to build experiences uh, that can be shared, that do not rely on uh, curves to, to optimize or to, to minimize, and uh, use uh, as much as possible your body to try to make knowledge out of these models. And now it is up to us to imagine new usages with uh, this technology, because, of course, what is... Uh, what exists right now is some kind of clickable interfaces or text-based interface, but language is not the, perhaps not the best way to interact with sound. Um, so perhaps it, there is here an opportunity to put um, more bodies or more sensibilities in, in this way. This is something to do uh, that remains to be done, I, I guess. I think I would personally agree on that because I'm teaching machine learning and oftentimes students have the problem that they only look at those, um, you know, evaluation values, you know, like M and log loss or whatever, accuracy, and I always tell them, peek into your data, listen to what you have learned, look at what your models really do. And oftentimes uh, people forget about that because they're only interested in uh, where the curve hits the bottom, so to speak. Yeah, and yeah. also that there is an epistemological conflict because, um, uh, I mean, measuring convergence is it's supposed to be uh, objective measurement. Uh, and if you listen, start to listen to it, you put your subjectivity uh, into it. So basically you switch uh, disciplines when doing this. And it's not uh, obvious, even for, stu even for researchers, to produce knowledge, uh, academically speaking, uh, doing this switch. So for students, uh, it's a good thing to teach them. Uh, I, I agree on that, yeah. Yeah, very important. Any other questions? Yeah, I see someone over there. But I think that must be the final one, because we are really late in time, and I heard there's a film projection plant in this room.
So the fascinating talks and a kind of theme in the background is fear of new technology. But today we're actually getting tons of benefits from technology that was very feared in the past. Just thinking about the energy and the time that my washing machine uh, saves me from is, is blows my mind. So what I would like to hear from maybe from each of your perspective is what is pure spe speculation. What, but what do you think new opportunities we're going to get from this kind of technology that you're researching? I think that's also good for finishing the session. So maybe we should start with you, Jim. What will be the long-term benefits <laughs> coming out of new <laughs> developments that you're using, like de like deep learning techniques? I don't know. One? Like technology, it really depends on how you define technology. Because I think the single most important technological achievement in human history is paper towels. <laughs> like, <it's, laughs> I, you think about the washing machine, and I'm like, what would I do without paper towels? And that just. Um, it's, I, I really think there needs to be, I just, I can only speak for the, as a musician, as a composer, and uh, I really think that it's kind of inevitable where the technologies we're focusing on are going. It's just a matter of um, raising awareness of what they can and cannot do so that people don't anthropomorphize them and make, uh, you know, make their fortunes out of misinforming people and uh, selling these things in, auctions and for huge amounts of money just as AI art, but hundreds of humans are involved in the creation of these things. So I think just uh, let's not try to block the technological developments, just try to understand them and figure out what works the best for us. Thank you. And Becca? Um, yeah, I mean, to add to that, I guess, um, I, I don't think I, I'm, I'm not working in AI or machine learning like, like everyone else here, but um, I don't necessarily have a fear of technology. I love it and I love, um, yeah, I, I, just, I just think what I'm trying to do with my research is to kind of entangle um, computers and technologies with a wider um, kind of ways of being, ways of knowing and just not just kind of think of it as this kind of growth um, a kind of capitalist perspective on technology, but try and recreate it, make it ourselves, hack it, um, use it in the ways that we want to. Um, so that's kind of where that's coming from anyway. Yeah. Um, Last but not least. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure there are only benefits, but uh, if I should uh, pick one, I uh, would say that uh, technology and AI basically uh, may open up creative practices to other uh, communities of people uh, that may not have been included in, uh, in musical practice, social musical practice. When I was at, at Goldsmiths, um, I contributed to a project called uh, Sound Control, uh, which was led by Rebecca Fubrink, another important uh, researcher in machine learning for creativity. And uh, basically, it was a design project um, trying to design uh, machine learning uh, in, in collaboration with a music therapist and uh, children uh, with either physical or cognitive disabilities. And so basically, um, over two years of project, uh, we managed to, to include uh, these children in some social, kind of social musical activities, which was not possible with the standards, um, for example, pi pianos or acoustic instruments. So there are opportunities to include uh, um, a more diverse set of uh, persons in uh, music making, for example. But the question is, um, at the expense of who, um, which communities uh, are going to be, may be excluded from, uh, from musical practice. Because as we've seen, if, it's auto if music composition can be automated, I guess that some musician uh, so will not be able to make a living out of it as uh, uh, simpl simply as, uh, as they may have been doing in, uh, in the last uh, years. Yeah, they might have to learn and make new music, so that's... Uh, yeah, true. Yeah, or we, yeah. we will have to make people to teach to have better quality standards in music, <laughs> I would personally say. <laughs> okay, thank you very much to all three thank of you. you. Uh, thank you for the audience. And I think this closes the research networking day. I hope you had a great time and uh, see you back next year. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>